My wife and I have started the process of looking for a house, so you're stuck with us for a little while. Sorry about that. Uh, so we are, we started that. Thank you. For those of you clap and see me afterwards, and I'll give you the money, I promise. So we're starting the process of, of trying to find uh, the, the house that we're going to settle into and, and raise our family in. And one of my friends, when they were selling their house, had a brilliant idea, and that was they hid voice recorders all over their house so they could actually listen and get feedback from the people going through the house. So when you offer your initial offer, they could tell whether or not they were bluffing and whether or not they really loved uh, the house. Now, I am now paranoid as a result of that. And so I walk through a house, and I don't say anything positive, and I could be in love with the house, and I'm like, this place looks like a dump. I would never want to live here. You twist my arm, baby, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, and Brooke thinks I'm out of my mind because she doesn't understand how devious people like me are. And, uh, and my wife is somebody who's wired very differently than me, which is a, a great benefit. And it's one of the reasons that I'm convinced that God brought us together. But Brooke sees the glass as half full, even if there's no water in it. And I, I just see an empty glass. And so we walk through a place, and it'll be the ugliest house you've ever seen in your life. And Brooke's like, there's so much potential in here. And I'm like, baby, you can't, don't say that. She's like, why? I'm like, they have sound recorders. She's like, no one does that. I'm like, they do, they do. I'm like, you can't, you can't say that. So, so I won't even talk about the property, really, when, when I'm in the property, other than to say uh, what I hate about the property. And we went through, we went through a property not too long ago. That, that we loved some of the features uh, about the house, but when we went inside, it was hideous. And it was like, we're going to have to redo everything. We would, we would not want to live in here, and our offer is going to have to be indicative of that. Now, that's one of, the, that's one of the things that you experience when you're house hunting. It's a very stressful process. It takes a lot of time. It's a big decision. And as you're going through things, you realize how differently you would do things. And the reality is, as we're walking through, it just dawned on me. I hate so much about this house, and that's okay. Because I'm not the creator of the house. I didn't create the house. So I didn't get to dictate what color carpet they used, or what color they painted their walls, or why they, they did what they did. Because I didn't design it. If I would have designed the property, I would have had all the say in the world. But I was not the one who designed the property. I was now looking at the property and seeing how could I redesign and what could I change if it becomes mine. But I was not the original designer. And that changes everything. Because the original designer is the person who got all the input in what color carpet to use, what color they painted the walls, how the layout of, how the, layout of the house was laid out. That's their right as the designer. This morning, we're going to see one of, one of the truths that applies to all of us. And it has to change for those of us who follow Jesus. It has to change how we see everything. It has to change how we see everything. And in order to do that, we're going to go back to the very start. We're going to go back to the beginning. And you can follow along on your Bible app events on your phones or your tablets. And if you don't have those, you can follow along on the screens. We're going to look at a portion of Genesis 1 this morning where it all began in the very first chapter of the Bible where we read these words starting in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, right off the bat, what we see is something that's very foundational and it's something that none of us can fully wrap our minds around because we're not on the level of God. But that is this. Then God said, let us make man in our image image. And so right off the bat, what we see is that God is one, and yet he's, he's, he's three. We see the Trinity right off the bat here. And for those of you who are new to church, you're like, what in the world are you talking about? One of our foundational beliefs is this, that God is one. He's one being, but in three distinct persons. So there's God the Father, 
who is a spirit. There's God the Son, who is Jesus, who came to this world, died on the cross for our sins, rose three days later, paid the price for all of our sins and all of our mistakes so that we could be united with God. And then there's God the Holy Spirit, who's also spirit, and he comes and resides, literally resides within those of us who follow Jesus. So God is all three of those distinct per- people, and yet they're all separate. And if you're like, huh? That, right, I get you. It's really hard to fathom, and we can't fully wrap our minds around it because nothing else operates like that. Nothing else operates like that. And we just have to embrace the fact that, very simply, we are not on the level of God. And the sooner that we embrace that fact, the sooner that we come to terms and really, really accept the fact that God is bigger and higher and knows more than we will ever know and has a grander plan than we will ever fathom, as soon as we can just fully grasp that to the best of our ability, we can let go of so many things that we carry around. So we understand God is bigger than us and he is in control. And here's the problem. Many of us, we want God on our own terms. The problem is many of us want God on our own terms. Like this whole idea of, of a trinity, we can't fully wrap our minds around. We're like, well, that, that doesn't make sense. Why would God choose to do it that way? Why wouldn't God do it this way? Or we look at things in our own lives and we say, God, it doesn't make sense that you didn't do this. Why instead didn't you do that? Or we, we read principles that God has set forth and we say, well, I don't really like that principle, so I'm going to try it this way instead of following this way. The reality is when you boil it all down, so many of us want God on our own terms. But God made humanity. He made us, and he instructed us to oversee the rest of his creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Understand, you were created in the image of God. You have intrinsic value. You have immense worth. You were created in the image of God. But some, somewhere along the way, we lose sight of that. Somewhere along the way, we, we forget that fact. And we let life beat us down. And we let life break us. And for so many people, we we find our value in what our ex said about us. Or what our friends think. Or what our parents told us when they were mad. And we derive our value out of the wounds that we have from our parents. Or out of the fact that our marriage didn't work out. And our ex said this about us. And it enrages us. And yet at at the heart, there's just a piece of that that we can't let go. And we still hold on to. And we're never fully able to break free from and we let our friends tell us how much value we have and we choose to we choose to push this this idea away that we are intrinsically valuable because all we see are our flaws and they're magnified and we compare ourselves and our failures against everybody else's fantasy that they put on Facebook and they put on Instagram and Snapchat and we think that's their reality and we know our reality doesn't measure up to what they're selling and so we beat ourselves up constantly we think I'm not good enough I can't do it I will never measure up I'm not as good as they are and we allow ourselves to become defeated and discouraged all the while they feel the exact same way. They're just presenting a different reality, but we don't, we don't take the time to really grasp the fact that they have problems too. Their problems just aren't on display. And so we compare the truth of our lives against the, rea- the, the fantasy of them, not against their reality, and we think, I will never measure up. I will never be good enough. I will never have it all together. And then we think about what our friend, who used to be our friend, said to us. And the wound that cut us to the core. And then there's the wounds from our childhood that we never really dealt with. When our parents lashed out. When they were angry. We think about every person that we failed and what they've clapped back with. And somewhere along the way we lose sight of just how valuable we are. 
And we convince ourselves, if I could only do this, if I could only change this, if I could only be this way. And the whole time we miss the fact that in the image of God, we were created. That's our value. Not in what my friends say about me, not in what my parents say about me, not in what my exes say about me. My value is derived in the fact that I am created in God's image. And because of that, I have value. And I have worth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And I want you to understand something. Your gender is not an accident or inconsequential. In the same way that you as a person are created in the image of God, God assigned you a gender that is not accidental. And it's not inconsequential. And over the course of the last four or five years, we've seen a lot of things portrayed in our society. A couple of years ago, Miley Cyrus told Billboard magazine that she often thinks about her gender identity, saying that she doesn't really identify as a boy or a girl, and that her gender identity also exists outside of the binary. I think about being a girl all the time, Miley said. I'm always like, it's weird that I'm a girl because I just don't feel like a girl. And I don't feel like a boy. This week, singer Sam Smith revealed in an interview, I'm not male or female. I think I flow somewhere in between. It's all on the spectrum, he says. He added that he had always resented being feminine in many ways and describes being non-binary as being your own special creation. And here's the heartbreaking thing that we see. That for those who struggle with their gender identity, over 50% of transgender people contemplate suicide. Nine times higher than the national average. Over 50%. 42% of non-binary individuals attempt suicide. 42%. And I know some might be thinking, well, why are we talking about this? Only 0.6% of the population identifies as as transgendered, and even fewer identify as non-binary. So why why even discuss this? Why Why does it matter? And it matters because, number one, every single person matters to God. Number two... It matters because we understand that more and more people are struggling with these issues as society looks at them in a different way. Number three, we talk about this because we want you to understand that even if you struggle with gender identity, even if you struggle, you are immensely valuable. You are not a punchline. You are not a joke. And we don't see you as a statistic. We see you as a person who has immense value and intrinsic worth. And we want for you what we want for everyone. And that is the best, most fulfilling life. And we understand that in order for any of us to find that, The only path to that is through a relationship with Jesus, which brings us back to our creator and the reason that we were created in the first place. So listen to me very clearly. If you are here and you struggle with gender identity, you are not a freak. You aren't a freak. And we don't view you as a statistic. You may and probably have been marginalized in the eyes of some, maybe even marginalized in the eyes of many. But you aren't marginalized in the eyes of God. You have intrinsic value. You have intrinsic worth. You matter to God, and you matter to us here at Lakeside. I want you to know you are welcome here. But I want you to know this because of our love and our concern and our care for you. And I want to go back to the end of the Sam Smith quote. where He describes being non-binary as being, quote, your own special 
creation. This is why transgenderism is dangerous. Because it steps outside of God's design. And it elevates you personally to the level of God. It says, in spite of the fact that I was created in the image of God with a distinct plan by God for my life, I know better than my creator. And when we put ourselves on the level of God, and we step outside of God's plan and put forward our own plans for our life, that becomes idolatry. And because we care about you, we'll tell you that truth. When we operate in God's design, we can experience hope and peace and joy, and you're like, how, how does that make sense? The way that that makes sense is God's original design for us as individuals was to have a relationship with our Creator. And that's been messed up by all of us, by the choices and the decisions that we make. And yet God loved us so much that He came and He died on the cross for our sins so that we could have a relationship with Him. And that renewed relationship that is available to us through a personal relationship with Jesus restores the whole reason that we were created in the first place. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want you to understand that you are intrinsically valuable. You are have immense worth. God created you. God designed you. And God doesn't make mistakes. And if you are struggling and you feel marginalized and you feel like there's no one you can talk to and there's no place you can go, I want you to know, again, you are welcome here. We love you and we value you. But our love and our value of you compels us to be honest with you. But if you're struggling with these issues or if you're looking at people who struggle with these issues, what I want you to know is, is this. There's hope. God's not scared. Throughout the heart changes everything. What we've seen is we've seen God's design for relationships. And so we've seen the need within God's design for relationships that we love each other. That we love one another. Husbands, you set the lead in this. That you love your spouse. Love one another. That you serve one another. You serve one another. Wives, you set, the, you set the lead in this. That you try to elevate your husband's disposition as more important than your own. This is God's design. That you keep your intimacy to you and your spouse. That it's something that happens frequently, but it's something that happens privately. And it's between you and your spouse. And that's God's design. God didn't design sexless marriages. But God's design is that you would be fulfilled. You would fulfill one another. You would serve each other. You would care for each other. And you would keep it private between you and your spouse. And not invite other people in. That you would honor the vows that you made. That you would be committed to one another. throughout your lives, that there would be safety in security within relationships, that it's okay if you're not married, 
that we've seen that not everybody was designed to be married. And you are not a second-class citizen if you're somebody who has no desire to be married. And if you do have a desire to be married, it's always, 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 always better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. And here's the reality. We all make mistakes. For some, it's been a failed marriage. For some, it's been adultery. For some, it's been anger. For some, it's just been abandonment. We don't write off the person who's gone through a divorce. We don't write off the person who's abandoned their family. We don't write off the person who's stuck in a relationship where they refuse to love their wife. We don't write off the person who's stuck in a relationship who refuses to serve their spouse. We don't write off the person who's addicted to porn. We don't write off the person who just decides, I'm not going to be intimate with my spouse. We don't write off the person who struggles with a number of these areas. And we want you to understand that you are never too far gone for God to do a work in your life. You've never made a mistake too great that God would ever look at you. The very person that he created, the very one that he designed, you could never make a mistake big enough that God would write you off and say, I no longer love you. I no longer care about you. I no longer want anything to do with you. God loves you. And he sees the scars. He sees the hurt. He sees the pain. He knows about the mistakes. Spoiler alert, he knew about your mistakes before you made them. He knew about your mistakes before you did. And he still loves you. And wants you. We all have wounds. We all carry baggage. We all have scars. But God's love's bigger. And God is greater. So, what's our response? As we, as we wrap up the relationship series next week's the last week of it, and we're going to be answering your questions because we understand that so much of this is nuanced. And so many of these principles are universal because they're true biblically, and yet in the application of them, it can sometimes be very, very difficult. And so if you have questions about how this applies to you individually, how it applies to specific situations that may be outside of the norm a little bit, or you just want some clarification on something, next week is for you. And you can go to the end of the Bible app event on your phone or your tablet that you're following along with right now, or as Al said earlier, you can visit us online at lakeside-church.com. You can submit your question and know this. Your question will be completely anonymous unless you say, Hi, I'm Brian writing in to ask about this. Well, then it probably won't be anonymous. But if you don't want to drop your name, that's fine. And if you accidentally drop your name like that, we won't read it off next week as we answer the question to everybody. So don't worry about that. But we want to answer your questions because we understand relationships have the ability and the power to ruin your life faster than anything else. That's why the Bible is so clear. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. That's why I'm telling you, for those of you who are dating, listen to me. Be incredibly picky. Be incredibly picky about who you'll marry. And I know, I know that you love them now, but you don't even know them yet. You don't. 
you know what they want you to know. And, and they'll let you in on a little bit of something. And then you'll get married, and you won't even know them for the first six months. You think you will. And then six months hits, and you're like, who did I marry? Who are you? And you know what? They're thinking the exact same thing about you. They're like, well, that was a mistake. Now what, right? Well, the reality is you just got to work on it. Because you, like, we're, we're incredible. On one hand, we don't think we, on one hand, we don't think we have any value at all. And on the other hand, we think we're God's gift to everyone. It's amazing. All within the same messed up person that we are. We're like, I don't have any value. I believe what everybody said about me. I don't have any worth. And then on the other hand, we're like, yeah, they, don't, they just don't get me. They don't understand. Like, they, they don't. And within all of that, there's this truth that we have to come to terms with. And that is this, that love is not a feeling. We have to work our way to a feeling. But if we require on feelings to carry us through a marriage or a relationship, that marriage will end. That relationship will be unfulfilling. Because love requires work. It requires action. So we want to help you in the specific areas of that next week. If you've gone through a divorce, we love you. And we want to help you through that process. If you're in the midst right now of a terrible marriage, we love you. We want to encourage you and help you through that process. If you're young and in love and blind to the fact that the person that you're in love with has any flaws whatsoever, enjoy it while it lasts, but be very careful. And if you need somebody else's input, we're not just going to walk up to you and say, hey, yeah, you should really break up who you're dating with. But if you want somebody else's input and and you ask, hey, what, what do I need to look into? What red flags are there? We'll be honest with you. We'll tell you what to look for. Why? Because we hate who you're dating? No. No, One or two people that we know? No. That was a joke. It's like five or six, not one or two. No. Just kidding. Not because we hate them, but because we want to walk, we want you to understand. We want to help you see things. If you're struggling with your gender identity, we want you to know that we don't marginalize you and think you're a freak and think, oh, you, you, can't, you can't darken the doors of this place. Our hearts can't even imagine all that you've experienced and all that you're coping with and going through. And we want to walk alongside you in that process because at the core, what we are is a community. And it's a bunch of broken, messed up, flawed people. How do I know that? Because I'm broken. And I'm messed up. And I'm flawed. And so is everyone I've ever met. The question is, what are we going to do about it? So let's choose to be a place that says, hey, we're going to love people. Because living life's hard enough. And in that love, we're going to speak the truth, but it's always going to be done in love. And we're going to walk alongside each other. Every step of the way. And in the process, pointing each other to Jesus so that we become more like him in all of our brokenness and all of our hurt and all of our disappointment and in all of our success. We choose love and we choose to walk together to become more like Jesus. God, I pray that you would help us be people who love one another Pray, God, for those of us who are broken and flawed, which is all of us. 
that you'd work in our lives. I pray for those who are going through a divorce or a breakup right now. I pray that you would comfort them. I pray, God, that you would help them see you work. Help them accept the fact that they are to blame for some things. Help them accept the fact that they're not to blame for some things. And God, help them, for those who who are married and and it's not final, help them fight for their relationships. God, I pray for those who are married in here, and I pray that they would choose each day to fight for the good of their spouse. I pray that each day they would wake up and they would say, we made a vow, we made a commitment, and God, we're going to do our best to honor that. And God, that you would just intervene. I pray, God, for the person who's single and discontent. I pray, God, that you would just provide them contentment. And if it's in your plan for them to marry, that in your perfect time, you would bring them someone who would bring them much joy. But God, you wouldn't allow them to believe a lie that they're not enough, that they're not complete. They need more. God, I pray for people who are struggling right now with this whole idea of their gender. And I pray, God, that you would give them peace. I pray that this wouldn't be born out of stereotypes of society. God, I pray that we would be a place that comes alongside people regardless of what they're struggling with and loves them, points them to you. God, I pray for people here who believe the lives of their parents, believe the lies of their ex, believe the lies of their friends, believe the lies of themselves. God, who a long time ago Stop seeing their value. And in the quietness of this moment, God, I just pray that you, your spirit would break through and you would just whisper to their heart how much you love them, how valued they are. That you created them. In your image. Pray, God, that is a truth that they would cling to and never lose sight of. Work in our hearts, work in our lives, we ask. In your son, Jesus' name.